Hello and welcome to a new episode on the Italian PNG channel of the new series from Beyond the Ice Walls. So this is the second series or actually a sequel of my original series of the Lands Beyond the Ice Walls. What is this map? What are the Lands Beyond the Ice Walls? What am I talking about? Well, the answers are all here and all in the previous videos I made. But to recap very lightly and to just get a quick view of all we've done in the past, but the important thing is that this shows the Earth as um, surrounded basically by these ice walls. And these ice walls are what else but Antarctica. So Antarctica surrounds the world, we already know about this, and the way it works on this map is that there's four gates that divide basically what is inside of the known world, as it said, from what is outside of the known world, which is called Atlas. Everything inside of this ring, basically, is called Atlas. And this was the entire like point of the original series. We looked at all the continents and peoples and countries that were basically existing in the Atlas. So from the Roman continent of Thoth, then the Grand Orchestra, the continent of Aten, the Xenonesia Archipelago, the lands of Geminia, Petatia, Shangri-La, and so on and so forth. There were a lot of informations we dwelled upon and we informed ourselves upon. Of course, a lot of metaphorical things and in general the map was very beautiful. Uh, it had very large amounts of art and just general pieces of information that made it very uh, appealing to look at. But now this new map, which is made by the same people that made on that one, basically, is, um, or the same creator, you know, is basically uh, around the second ring. So what is the second ring? The second ring beyond the ice walls is the lands that are not beyond the ice walls themselves, but the lands that are beyond the second level of the ice walls, which are the mountain ring. Of course, these are not literal ice walls. They do have ice on them, I guess, but these are not like Antarctica. This is another thing. Like, it's the second level, basically. And this new series I'm just doing right now is focusing on everything inside this second ring of continents, lands, and people, etc, etc, which is called Akupara. So everything inside of the second ring right here is called Akupara. Now, let's get into what we will do in this episode. Uh, last episode, I did a little introduction where I talked about the walls of Asgard, Asgard the First Empire, Valhalla, even Hyperborea, as you can see right here, basically. Uh, there were a lot of information we delved upon, and this map is very beautiful, so I even talked about that. But we talked basically about this part of the map, and then we went eastwards to talk about Eden, so the Primordial Garden, the Garden of Eden, you know, the one in the Bible, and blah blah blah. So that's what we did last time, except for the recap. This time, I had to take a lot of time to actually like research the topics for this video, because there were a lot of informations I had no idea about. Uh, this map is huge, so it has a lot of continents, a lot of land masses that a lot of times I do not know things about. So it took me a bunch of time basically to research some of these, and I even had to go to the creator of the map itself and ask him what some of these were. So. Let's start by the one I researched, uh, not by myself, but like thanks for the creator, which is Waldrum. In the last episode, I mentioned the fact that I had no idea what this was because I never saw it and I couldn't find anything about it online. And that still goes for this time, except now I'm actually informed because the creator actually let me know what this was about. So in the last, um, basically the last season, I could, you could probably say, but in the last series when we worked about the entirety of the Atlas, we talked about the Aten continent, so the Grand Orchestra, and we talked about how the population that lived in Aten were the uh, Duendes. So what are the Duendes? Well, I'll show you right here and right now. The Duendes are a population of like kind of hominid creatures that inhabited um, um, the continent of Aten, and the way they were portrayed were, was that they couldn't really do like voices, they don't, didn't have the capacity to actually uh, like say words or comprehend language, but they were kind of semi-intelligent hominids, so no homo sapiens kind of thing, but still kind of a population that understands uh, information. And now you can see like all these divisions, orc brownies, leprechauns, goblins, gnomes, dwarves, hobgoblins, these aren't necessarily the ones, you know, in, you know, fantasy and folklore, so it's not necessarily that, but it is uh, a, like just a way to divide them into categories because of course they are different from what a human would say and would know, so the people that first encountered the Duendes decided to divide them between these uh, multiple categories, but of course, once again, it's metaphorical, you don't have to take it literally, there's no orc brownies running around, that's what I'm saying. Uh, but the Duendes were this population of hominids, and the Duendes, the Duendes themselves actually originated from somewhere between um, 
the like land masses of Earth, so not outside of the ice walls, but they originated inside, and they actually originated from a specific type of creature, which was called the Homo floresiensis, which is right here. I had to censor some parts out because, you know, I don't know if YouTube wants me to show this part, but basically Homo floresiensis was this kind of hominid that is uh, historically recorded to live in the island of Flores, which was an island in the Indonesian archipelago, and it was kind of uh, east of Jakarta, so the capital of Indonesia. So if we go to this map, we can see that it is right here. Um, yeah, right here. And the island of Flores was very small, it wasn't like very developed, you couldn't really do a lot. So the people that inhabited it, which were like a distant relative of modern day humans, were very different and very different uh, shapes than modern day humans. They were with the amount of bone around the eyebrow uh, area basically, they had no chin, they had very short like stature, they were three feet tall, so you can even understand just how small these people were. And these are not like fantasy things, these are real human beings, I mean at least hominids, that existed at some point in time. So the way the duendes are made to exist is basically that the Homo floresiensis actually managed to escape this land mass that they originated from and travel all the way outside of the ice walls through the serpent gate and eventually find themselves on Aten. And we already saw this in the um, episode, I think the second episode that I made on the original series. But what is interesting is that there is a continuation of the story through the outside of the mountain ring, and that is the continent of Weldrum. Well, what is Weldrum then? Weldrum is literally the landmass that was the result of the arrival of the uh, uh, of the duendes, basically, to the to Akupara, so the second ring. Uh, so what happened basically? The native duendes eventually developed some seafaring skills, so they managed to create boats, create navigations, especially since the contact with the Europeans. But even before then, they were able to, you know, travel by boat, as seen by their voyage from the island of Flores all the way to the uh, continent of Aten. So eventually these duendes, and we do not know which type of these actually may went there, uh, these were probably more modern types of divisions originally, you just have to consider something more akin to this guy, and he eventually went from the continent of Aten all the way to uh, Weldrum. So if we want to trace a little line here to divide, divide basically, actually not just to divide, to just show what the travel might have looked like, they probably started somewhere here in Aten, then went all the way to Motoputua, which is another part, like southern part of Aten, you can consider it a different continent if you will, probably made stops to these islands here, even if the explanation in the last series didn't have the Duendes living here, and then eventually uh, circumnavigated the islands of La Apija and these other places to go into this passage right here that brings to Weldrum. So as you can see it's very easy, it's not something that is impossible for the duendes to do, and it's actually very probable this was the route they took to arrive to Weldrum. So what happened in Weldrum? Why is it important? Well, Weldrum basically is not just a random continent, but it, its geography basically affected the uh, duendes that went there. So you know basically how the duendes were very very small, even in stature you can see 150 centimeters, 90 centimeters, 110 centimeters. These for the uh, American folks are like 3 feet tall, 4 feet tall, things like that. Very small, right? And the reason the Homo floresiensis, so the ancestor of the duendes, was this mole was actually due to something called uh, insular dwarfism. This is a scientific phenomenon that happens when a population that can be either human but even just like an animal is found to be restricted to a small geographical area either by like a mountain ring, a mountain chain or more often through an island. So that's why it's insular, so island dwarfism basically. And this insular dwarfism basically uh, makes it so that since they have so little resources available, they shrink in size, the actual people, the actual creatures, shrink in size eventually through the generations to adapt to the kind of uh, environment they have. And the opposite of this is what we see in the actual uh, land of uh, Weldrum, basically. So through their voyage to Ak Aten, they got a bit like a bit bigger, but through their voyage to Weldrum, the Duendes actually got way, way bigger. So from going like from three feet, as you can see the Florum of Orientis, to like four feet, like the, what is like, Orc Brownies, uh, the Hobgoblins, once again, these are like code names, you don't have actual Orc Brownies or Hobgoblins. 
and then eventually you get to the people of Welrum, which is literally translated to the land of the trolls or the home of the trolls. So what do you mean trolls? Basically the duendes that live in Welrum are giants. They have something opposed to insular dwarvism, which is insular gigantism, which is when you have so many resources in a large amount of space without any natural predators or anything uh, above you in the food chain and no like uh, necessarily no wars, no like like famines, stuff, things like this. So eventually a population grows very large in size thanks to their environment. Which is the reason why the people of Weldrum, these duendes, are called trolls, because they are so big compared to their original sizes that they'll reach things like seven feet, eight feet. So we're like giants, alright? And that's why they are called the like giants of like Weldrum or the trolls, you know? There's a race of giants basically. Uh, there's also a rumor of another creature inhabiting the land of Weldrum, but this is more of a rumor than like a state of fact. And these are actually another like creature that originates from in the Atlas region of the uh, plane of existence as we're seeing it. And the Atlas region, as we saw, is everything outside of the ice walls, but inside of the mountain ring. And in this case, it's in Shangri-La. So we saw about this in the seventh, I believe, episode of the original series. And Shangri-La was the garden of the Volga Volk. The Volga Volk are, according to the creator of the map, uh, a race of like, uh, like intelligent kind of lizards, uh, like not 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 human. This, the important thing is they are not humans and they are kind of like reptiles. Okay, so that's like the the main gist of it. So there's this hypothesis that has been made by scientists throughout the years and this hypothesis is that basically uh, dinosaurs if they were left alone and they were not made to like die out with the probably asteroid maybe volcanic explosions earthquakes and so on and so forth if this did not happen eventually some dinosaurs will reach a level of sapiens that is comparable or at least relatively comparable to humans and humankind and that is basically the concept we're going off with Shangri-La. We talked about this once again in the last series and I don't want to reiterate it because it's not really necessary to know when it comes to the uh, Akupara region. So everything outside of the mountain ring. And in Weldrum there's said to be another like distinct but united race of beings that are related to the people of Shangri-La. And these people are basilisks basically. They're, that's the name they're given to them. Basilisks, which is one other fantasy name, you know, basilisks used to be in, I believe, medieval folklore, uh, a creature that would be able to, like, petrify you with its eyes, and uh, with a very powerful venom, they could be either, like, serpents, or another way they would be, the, um, like, represented was, like, they had this kind of, like, dinosaur-looking body, uh, but with, like, more uh, avian features, so features of a bird like uh, the head of a rooster and the tail of a serpent. It was weird. I have. I remember when I was a kid, I had that toy that was of the basilisk, as in the fantasy one. And this was like this weird combination of these different animals. The tail of a serpent, the eyes of a of like a dragon, the face of a rooster, the body of a winged beast of a bat. It was a weird stuff. But the important thing is basically there's the rumor that there is like this releaser, the intelligent creatures in Weldrum as well as the Duendes, as we already talked about them. But yeah, that's basically Weldrum for you, Destiny Manifest. So it's literally the Destiny Manifest of the Duende kind. Okay, and that's where I will finish with the description of Weldrum. Now we can go to the description of Polybius, the Psy... Psychonauts Oasis. I had to repeat this one for a second there. And okay, so this one is very, very different. This is one of the places that I had no previous information from and I had to research, uh, like very in depth research. I think I figured it out basically. That's what I'm seeing. So, what is Polybius? What is the Psychonauts Oasis? This landmass doesn't have any available specific information on it. What I found were the writings of an ancient Greek statesman and historian, which is called Polybius. So, to actually start the history of the landmass of Polybius, I think we have to start from the actual historian named Polybius, which we will show right here. So, Polybius is basically this dude, as you can see. Uh, Polybius was a historian that documented the rise of Rome, so the Roman Republic in this case, and the Roman, uh, yeah, the Roman uh, Republic. It was not an empire yet, because it was in the second century before the birth of Christ. But uh, Polybius was also in the military as a military commander of the Achaean cavalry, 
and the Achaean cavalry was the cavalry of the Achaean Confederation, which was a, like a union of city-states in the region of modern-day Achaea, Greece, this region right here. I just gotta point it out for you, because it's very small to compare to the actual uh, continent of Polybius. And basically, what about it? What about Polybius and his uh, career as a military and uh, uh, cavalry commander, basically? Well, his job in the military led him on multiple voyages, like the one where he visited Numidia, uh, which is a region in North Africa corresponding to modern-day Algeria and Morocco. So, regions that at the time were not really considered like the integral part of like civilization, you know? You had places like Egypt, which, well, which were very well known, places like Rome, Italy, uh, so Italy basically, uh, Greece, Hellas, uh, like Anatolia, Persia, but then there were like these borderlands, okay, so these borderlands which people from like these internal regions would like well, uh, go on explorations about and try to inform themselves on, because eventually the Romans would expand even to these regions and they had like diplomatic uh, relations with the kings of Numidia, so they had all, all these like diplomatic uh, like information coming from there and that's why one of their jobs that uh, was for you know Polybius was actually just going to these places and informing the higher-ups in the military about them so he went on this journey on North Africa to see what was going on with the, the borderlands basically so basically what happened was that Polybius also did another expedition he did an expedition after his travels to Carthage so Carthage was a major city and like northern Africa, so modern day Tunisia, very close to the city of Tunis, basically. And the city was very well known because it was the capital of the Carthaginian Empire or the Carthaginian Republic, and it was the main rival of the Roman Republic at the time. Uh, so basically, Polybius participated in the siege of Carthage in the third war uh, against Carthage, basically, because um, you know, Rome and Carthage had three wars separately, which Rome won every single one of them. And eventually, this led to Carthage falling and being salted to the ground, literally. Just salt spread onto the surface of the city, just so nothing could regrow ever again. And yes, Carthage definitely lost that, and Roman, Rome conquered it. Eventually, it even reconstructed it, but uh, that's for another time. What is important to our story is that after this uh, journey to Carthage to take part in the siege of it, what Polybius did was he went to... Uh, another journey, this time in the Atlantic. And the Atlantic in those times was very, very mysterious. It wasn't the place people knew about, basically. It was outside of the known world, basically. So let me just trace this out so you can understand this. If you understand what I'm talking about, Carthage is like here. Actually, let me get a, a smaller, uh, smaller one of these. So Carthage is right here, all right? And Rome is right here. And this guy came from like here, all right? And the regions he visited were like like this, then this, then this, and then eventually he went to the Atlantic. So we don't know exactly where he went to the Atlantic, and this is where the myth of the landmass of Polybius comes from, basically. We just know that he um, went somewhere, but we don't know where. And the weird thing is, the Atlantic was completely unknown. The Romans did not know anything. They didn't even know about the Azores or the uh, Cape Verde Islands, basically. But we know that he did this journey, it's not just a hypothesis or something, because if um, in the 1st century uh, like AD, so 77 years before the birth of Christ, the Pliny the Elder, so another historian, a Roman one basically, made a book which is called Natural History, and in this book called Natural History, he recalls the voyages of um, Polybius, and he says that in these journeys, Polybius found, uh, found basically it's these, these wild continents with different creatures than what he found at home. But the weird thing is uh, he never mentions how the journeys were, like how the journeys went and where they were. He just mentions in the Atlantic. So the theory is, I think, in this map that the main link between Polybius and this description here, so the Psychonauts Oasis, is actually the word Psychonauts. So first of all, let's get what these Psychonauts are. Because when I first came to this realization, I actually like felt like this is wild, right? This, this is crazy. But it's not that crazy when you think about it. So first of all, uh, it, the description Psychonauts Oasis brings to a whole different area of research, 
which, which is called psychonautics. And psychonautics is the methodology that uses a person's mind as a way to discover more about the world beyond our knowledge as well as our inner selves. So it's not a method of real physical transportation or uh, voyages, but it is a way to know ourselves through the mind. You know, this is Pliny the Elder video, but this one uh, it is because I couldn't find any like nice images for like what uh, psychonautics really is about. But this is a, a good representation. This is more of an oriental, like a Eastern type of uh, psychonautics, but it's, uh, I think it still works. So it's basically a mix of meditation, but it can also involve taking kind of like psychedelics of different times. So by the way, this is Pliny the Elder, the guy that wrote the book, which is uh, Natural History, which is the one that recalls the voyages of uh, Polybius. And through psychonautics, you were able to discover more about the world. Uh, I actually had comments of people under my videos saying that through their own uh, voyages in the psych psychonautic, uh, basically, experience, they kind of reached the same conclusion in the lands that they saw on the previous map, map I, which is wild because I don't really believe the, like, the, the physical lands to be exact or something like that, but it's interesting that people see them in their psychonautic experiences. I think it's very interesting. And uh, the, even the etymology of the world psychonautics, which by the way, psychonauts is the like noun and etymology means literally the uh, translation of the world like the, the meaning of the world the, the origin of the word right and it is literally psyche which means mind or soul and nautis which means sailor or navigator so literally means navigating or like sailing in the mind and the soul so what does this mean for this map well i think it's pretty clear honestly when you think about it for like a couple seconds I think uh, Polybius did not make a physical journey. I think Polybius managed to achieve knowledge of the continent which was named after him, so Polybius, Psychonauts Oasis, through a psychonautic experience. So I think what he did was after all this entire thing here in Europe and Africa, he went on a journey on the Atlantic now with quotes and unquotes. And in his journey, he probably went to some of these locations like here. He found something uh, inside of him, basically through psychonautics, that allowed him to uh, unravel the mysteries of Akupara. Which means it makes sense, because when you, th when you think about something like this as, as like intense as um, psychonautics and intense like meditation or psychedelic taking, you think about things that are wild but it's some like it's things that are even like so uncomprehensible that the human mind cannot understand them and it is interesting that in this way the map portrays this as even like even further from earth itself than just like this sec the first ring it portrays it at the end of the second ring literally on the edges of the wastes the scorched wastes I think, I think this might be it, honestly, for the Polybius Psychonauts Oasis. I think this is the explanation that makes the most sense. It could be something else. You're welcome to also tell me. I found another, um, I found another track to research. It was about a video game, video game, basically. This one video game arcade thing that had like a, like a mystery, murder mystery with it, related to it. You're welcome to search for that too. I just thought it was a bit ridiculous and didn't really want to look at it into it because it, I think this is more about the historical figure and of course about psychonautic also because this psychonauts thing is another weirder thing. But yeah, I think this is basically what the Polybius continent is saying. So we, we saw basically Weldrum and Polybius's continents. Uh, these are of course very big continents. When I, when, I, when I make these videos, I don't really realize how big they are because we are inside of like the Akupara ring, the second ring. But when you compare these landmasses to Earth, you just realize how, how immense they are. Polybus alone is like the size of Asia, the entirety of Asia, and the Weldrum is like the size of South America or even Africa. These places are huge, which explains the insular gigantism for the uh, Duendes. And when it comes to Polybius, there's so much to discover, like it's actually crazy just how much is undiscovered and how much is just coming from the knowledge of one man that had a revelation through psychonautics. So that's crazy. Then we have the circumscribed ocean. 
yeah, that's just the name. I have no idea what this means. But uh, it, it, it's nice to have a, a random ocean. There's more interesting oceans on the Aquapara, on the second ring. Like the Archipelago Ocean. I find this very interesting. I am researching it as, the, as we speak. I have not found something specific, but I hopefully will in the next video. But we have more places to look at, and before we get to the last continent of this video, I want to have a little second here to talk about these scorched wastes. So we actually have this entirety of new things that have not been shown in the original map, but that are definitely present in this one. When we did the entirety of the ring outside of the ice walls, so Atlas, we saw that all of it was contained in this mountain ring. But this mountain ring was very, like, like confined. It wasn't that big of a deal, right? Like, you, you, you could see there's, there definitely was something outside of it. They, they even hinted at it, you know? In places like the Elysium, places like here, even Shangri-La, the fact that an entire civilization just sprung up in some place like here. This was different. This was not the end. But you know what is the end? Well, the wastes. And it makes the most sense if you get to have such an immense space where civilizations, uh, continents, places can be and can be inhabitable. It just makes sense that at some point this entire thing just stops and it becomes literal wastes. So literally unlivable scorching deserts or irradiated wastes. So nuclear fallout, walls of Asgard, so walls of the divine, the titanic forest, frozen wastes, volcanic wastes the abyssal ocean so so many of these are like specific but extremely harsh and the scorched waste which is the one i will be looking at today is no exception but it does have something that makes it different from the other wastes because some of these literally are void of anything like the frozen waste has a random ocean in it so who cares honestly volcanic waste has nothing on them this abyssal ocean and the, this the tiffin storm but you know it's just a storm sunken waste once again nothing irradiated waste even less than nothing we had seen something in the walls of Asgard, which was Valhalla, which is uh, a different kind of uh, interpretation of like the these maps when they, they portray Valhalla, the walls of Asgard, all these mythological northern stuff have difficult, difficult and different portrayals of them. And in this case, the Scorched Wastes has something that I found very interesting to research, which is Iram, the city of a, south of a thousand pillars. So first of all, what is Iram? What are we talking about here? Well, this actually is very concise. It's not like this big deal because we have very little information to go through, but it is something. I can tell you it's definitely something, all right? So, first of all, Iram is also called Iram of the Pillars. And when we think of Iram, we actually think of a city not a landmass or a continent. The size of this city as shown for the scorched waste is actually a bit too large to be a simple city, so it seems it's something else, but apparently according to history and according to where the like like the origins of the legend of Iram have started, it used to be a city. Well, where? Well, it is considered a lost city, but not somewhere outside of the ice walls or outside of the mountain ring or even in the scorched wastes. No, it actually is considered a lost city inside of the Arabian Peninsula, specific to the desert north of Yaz. It is specified somewhere like here, 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 you know, something inside of like modern day Saudi Arabia, just to see like, of a concept, you know. And why are we talking about this if it's outside of the ice walls? Well, the legend of uh, Iram is actually very interesting. Like, you can even see how it could be right outside of the Akupa region and not even inside of a ring, but even in the Scorch Waste. Well, why is that? That it's very simple to understand and to answer. Uh, because evidently, the only mention that we have of Iram, the city of a thousand pillars, is in the Quran, the holy book of Islam. So for those that don't know, the Quran is the holy book of the Muslims, just as the Christians have the Bible and the Jews have the Torah, the uh, Muslims have the Quran. And the Quran has a lot, like a lot of the Quran has to do with the past, 
like historical past but also has mixes of christianity in it like because of the origins of islam as a monotheistic religion so it takes a lot from other monotheistic religions that existed already at the time so christianity and uh, judaism um but anyway the thing is that iran the only mention of iran is in a list of cities that have been punished by god and when we talk about God, we're talking about the Abrahamic God, so it is the same thing for the Christians, Jews, and the Muslims, according to, you know, the, like the, the same thing, you know, the same Abrahamic God. Uh, and the thing is, the, the city is compared a lot to another couple cities that have been punished by God, but they are in the Bible. These are Gomorrah and Sodom, and they are located in modern-day Palestine or Israel, you choose correctly, uh, but uh, yeah, they're basically here. And the thing is, the description of the city is too specific to actually be one of these. This is the city of a thousand pillars, and their punishment was horrifying. Their punishment was not just a killing or something like that. It was not a gen genocide, it was not some kind of huge, uh, terrible crime or something. No, no, no. Their punishment was way worse, and this is where we get to the actual landmass. I think the punishment that the city of a thousand pillars have God has gotten from God himself, according to this map, is their relocation as a whole city and as a whole system to the scorched wastes, a literal desert hellhole that exists at the end of creation that means that their, this city is like punished in eternal desert hell. It's literally that, right? It's terrifying. Imagine your entire city is so sinful that God himself says, well, just killing them isn't enough. We need to eliminate them and bring them to eternal punishment in a way never seen before. And that is the why the reason that Iran, the city of a thousand pillars, is located in scorched waste. By the way, descriptions of um, Iran show it us this. By the way, there is also the, the like the the concept of the name Iran. Kind of sounds like Iran, the country, but I don't think there's any correlation. Uh, the other places mentioned in the same passage of the Quran when talking about places God has uh, punished also mentioned populations and the pharaohs. So it's very wild. There, there's very, very, very much of a link between the past and the present when it comes to Iran, the, th the city of a thousand pillars. So the next place after we talked about the city of a thousand pillars, Iran, is actually the last continent that we are going to explore in this video. This is a continent right above Wellroom, and it is New Cahokia. So the places uh, westwards of New Cahokia, I still have to research, but New Cahokia itself was probably one of the easiest one I could research, because the name itself implies what it is, and the description matches with the name Kingdoms of the Mounds. So let's get into it right as of now and start with the same exact process we went for the polybius one so what can be explained as cahokia inside of the ice walls before we actually get to the ice walls outside of them uh, the explanation is basically that we have to research for the old cahokia and where is that well the answer is actually pretty pretty easy and it is inside of North America, so in the uh, places inside of the ice walls. And Cahokia, uh, the original one, is a historically confirmed mega settlement in what is nowadays uh, basically near St. Louis, uh, modern day Miss the modern day state of Missouri in the United States. Uh, it's an archaeological site that represents the apex of urban development coming from the non-Mesoamerican uh, North American native population. Uh, for those that do not know, the North American population can kind of be divided in many many groups of course, but there's two macro groups that can be used to divide them, and those are the Mesoamerican populations, which were the ones living in Mesoamerica, which is basically the middle of uh, between South and North America, so all of almost all of Mexico, the islands of the Caribbean, and if everything up to like Northern Colombia and uh, Panama. And then we have the rest of North America, which was inhabited by the remaining uh, Native Americans. And these Native Americans created a civilization, which is actually called uh, colloquially the Mississippian civilization. So let's get into a map of this so we can just show you what this looks like. 
and this is what it looked like uh, Mississippian and Rheolithic cultures there were many actually of these kind of uh, mounds that were found but the specific one in the area near St. Louis is definitely the one that is the most interesting and the most developed. It is absolutely crazy just how developed the area around this uh, site was. So first of all, it's been long considered the most advanced Native American civilization in history, the Mississippian culture. Uh, only comparable to the ones in uh, basically the Aztec civilizations and the Mayan civilization, but nothing else in North America can com be compared to this civilization and its structures. You have to understand we're not talking about something like a city or uh, a small settlement or a village. No, we're talking about something more akin to an empire, a, a large, large uh, connection of urban development that expands in like kilometers all right so it's huge it's literally huge uh, just so we show a little image of what is actually look like according to reconstructions it's something like this uh, as you can see it involves a center which was probably according to historical research used for religious purposes and then all the villages uh, near it with all the huts with all the like towns with all these uh, houses and they were situated on mounds basically uh, the most important places much like the organization of pyramids in mesoamerica and uh, egypt and so far and so on uh, with basically the same kind of structures with the uh, triangular shaped things and all these kind of uh, devolved into mounds in the end of the day because this civilization was unfortunate not eternal in fact it developed in the 600 AD basically so 600 uh, years after birth of Christ and kind of started to fall uh, around the, the 13th to 14th uh, centuries AD uh, so that's basically the period we're talking about so according to this uh, narrative basically it's in the middle ages the late middle ages uh, for Europe so it's also called like the middle period in America as well in the Native American history uh, then we have no written records of this unfortunately we did I mean no written records of the civilizations that uh, lived in this area because apparently they had not developed written language but we do have that uh, the entirety of the archaeological findings that confirm this is a real thing basically uh, so basically how could this civilization uh, get the technology to create such an impressive uh, archaeological location and such an impressive uh, like connection and nets of urban development basically when compared to the other ones in the period because nowhere in north america is as developed as this places but you can see that the cultures themselves had connections between them so it's not impossible to come to like just to understand that this could happen uh, first of all we have to say that though we know that the native americans were fully able to create urban centers like these uh, it is intriguing how they went from being the golden sword of north america to losing their entire civilization and urban development in the 400 years between Cahokia as a like a civilization and as a like a, a settlement and the urban development sentiment and the European arrival to the area so like the English arriving to the area the Spanish arriving to the area and so on and so forth so it's kind of crazy when you think about it that this civilization was so huge so important and in just 400 years 300 years we went from this huge thing that was comparably uh, as large as the biggest European cities at the time so same period 1200s free free 1400s wholly comparable to some capitals to something that is basically unexistent and the only traces we have are the mounds themselves which uh, basically when excavated can uh, find the uh, like uh, remain remnants of these civilizations and this is basically exactly what New Cahokia is, even the name and the description, especially the description, really uh, link it to this kingdoms of uh, the monument of the mounds, kingdoms of the mounds. So it's literally what is said as in the original Cahokia. The question is, where did the people of the Cahokia region go and where did they origin from? So this is the thing I think is being addressed by the map itself and the reason why New Cahokia is outside of the mountain ring outside of the ice walls and not a part of like North America or something like that. So 
First of all, where do they come from? I do not believe there is some alien origin of these people. It makes sense that these people could come from North America and could develop these cities. They are not an underdeveloped civilization, just as the Aztecs and the Mayans and those that came before them could create beautiful cities and complicated architecture and urban uh, settlements inside North America, so could the people of Northern um, uh, North America. But the real question should be where they got to, where they went, why did they disappear, and why was this culture lost to time? In fact, the name itself, Cahokia, was taken from another tribe that lived in the area uh, when the French were discovering it, and unfortunately, it does not appear that there is like ethnic, uh, like contiguity between the Cahokians, so the actual inhabitants of the land when it was discovered and the ones that existed during the period of the Mississippi culture. So once again, there's something wrong with this because the civilization went and came by with leaving basically no trace but their archaeological traces, so no, no linguistic or ethnic traces that we can account for. And the, the, the reason for this is explained in this map, or at least this is one interpretation of it, is that basically the people that were in Cahokia itself eventually came across the uh, ice walls and came across the mountain ring and found themselves to be in New Cahokia, so in uh, the uh, Akupara in the second ring basically. That is the kind of thing we are looking at apparently according to this map. It could be also um, counted more like a travel of some kind of wormhole opening, so something like the Bermuda Triangle opening right here, and then being transported right in the Carousel Ocean or the circumscribed ocean here. But I do believe a more realistic option is just them going through the Tiger Skate and then doing the exact same path we saw with the Duendes to Weldrum, but instead of just stopping to Weldrum, they will get to New Cahokia. This could be an explanation because the civilization of that amount of land is possible that they could develop very uh, like uh, developed seafaring skills for a long time. The uh, European Eurocentric view of the world made it so that many thought that the Native Americans did not have very uh, developed um, n like navigate. Um, navigating and sailing uh, like uh, developments but this is kind of a myth we now know that and uh, the north american natives did have the knowledge necessary to travel long distances uh, through boats and through naval means so this is basically where we get to new cahokia and how it is explained literally as a post cahokian colony of the original inhabitants of the mississippi colon mississippi civilization and it is basically situated on this continent, which is very small compared to the ones we saw earlier, so Waldrum. The size of it is comparable to the west coast of the United States, so large but not insane, and it would not develop some weird def defect like insular gigantism or insular dwarfism because it is uh, large enough, I would say. And probably nothing was on this island before the uh, Cahokians came to them, so they didn't have to fight for resources or something like that, if you know what I mean. Uh, I think now that'll be the end of this video. We have discovered a lot of topics. We have talked about Weldrum, we have talked about Polybius, the Psychonauts, Oasis, we've talked about the uh, wastes and especially the Scorched Wastes with its city of a thousand pillar, Aram. And finally, we have even dwelled upon Cahokia and the origin of the people that lived in the Mississippi culture and all these stuff like this in this video. Um, I will continue the series if the reception keeps going good. Uh, the, the first episode I made was fantastic when it comes to reception, you guys really loved it and I did not dwell too far into topics in that one and I had less research than this one so I hope you guys enjoy this video just as much as the last one if not even more. Uh, I will keep going the series and I, I have a lot more topics to research and talk about. I'm very hyped for things like Scylla and Charybdis right here as well as places like Atlantis of course, Neotaurid, Horus, Amun. Ra, a lot of interest places, Anubis, Sky Caverns, uh, there's so much cool stuff that I want to talk about and we will eventually get to it in the next videos. So once again, thank you for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, leave a comment in the description 
button down below if you want to support the channel and spread the video for the algorithm and also just subscribe to the channel since like 80% of my subscribers uh, I mean of my viewers are not subscribed so if you want to do that uh, you can do that uh, otherwise just like the video and support the channel get your notifications on whatever you want to do you do it it's up to you I'm just a giver of information uh, thank you for watching and we will see each other in the next episode goodbye